Okay, it is now the end of 1944, so basically the turn of summer of 1944. And um, going off of a uh, last turn, how I was talking about the Axis really having the, the upper hand, they've definitely uh, been exploiting their mass amounts of resources and territories. And you can see here, we've got kind of a lay of the land. And um, the Allies, though, I've I've definitely I think most of the time I would probably just call it quits right now just because the Axis are so powerful right now, pretty much owning all of Eurasia. The only where they're kind of contested is down there in Africa, but only by a few um, British units. And then also uh, another place is right now in France where. Last turn, as you saw, the Germans were able to retake Paris, but now the Americans have once again sent more forces to Paris. They've completed that German um, bunker that was under construction. They've lend leased the French a tank, which is now in Paris. The British have marched into these two territories here in hopes of kind of getting a further beachhead and at least trying to hold Paris, like, or hold a hold France, like get a grip on France, and then from there be able to wage war, especially uh, trying to contest Germany in the future. Because of course, there's now only three turns left, including this turn. So, um, let's see, the Americans ha are just trying to get as many units as they can. You can see here we've got another transport load convoy that is being shipped across, that's gonna be landing in Normandy next turn. And then, given that they're going to have two more turns left, they'll probably be able to hopefully blitz a little bit farther into Germany. The French were able to take out a German Mediterranean fleet that had been sent out there to destroy the British Navy, uh, which has now stranded the Germans uh, on the Com uh, Canary Islands, which, yes, their planes can take off still, but they won't be able to use that as a forward base of operations. The biggest problem right now for the Allies is not only that German huge industri industrial base, but also the fact that, as you can see here, we have a German Navy, which is massive. That is a heavy battleship right there, along with tons of other ships. Plus, the fa and also you can see here that they can right now get out and hit the British, and though they may not have any transports, their navy will definitely be able to take on the British navy right now uh, and possibly even have some units left over to hit the Americans or at least defend the shorelines to trap the units that are in France and keep them there in France. The Italians too, the Germans have been lend leasing about 50 IPCs a turn for the past three turns. So you can see that task force marker represents this Italian navy and you can see that they actually have transports. And right here, this is a, um, it's not really a heavy carrier, but it's a carrier from an expansion set that I made where basically it has all the abilities of a fleet carrier plus the fact that it has a combat values of a battle cruiser. So this is a very powerful asset there. Um, and you can see with their naval base that they have, they can go one, two, three, and even with that French Navy, they could just leave some units behind to try and destroy that. As you can see, they also have a battleship sitting right there. Um, let's see. So, the Germans have pretty much ended Russia. They've taken Moscow, and Stalingrad is holding, but with one, inf or one militia left. So, that will probably fall next turn, especially with the fact that all these blitzing units can blitz down to the surrounded Stalingrad. Uh, I wanted to lend lease stuff to the Russians this turn, but there was one other th factors that fell into it, plus the fact that Stalingrad's their last major defendable position, and it's completely surrounded now. So uh, another option was to send up the FEC Air Force to Stalingrad. But as you can see, we've got the German Africa, Africa Corps. The Japanese just landed in Calcutta. And the Germans were able to launch an airborne assault up here in northern India and also build a militia. So they've pretty much trapped, they've pocketed, you've got um, 
the Indian army over here that can't connect to the Burma army over here. So that's another issue. The Americans have sent a small task force up here. They've landed troops in Kamchatka and are probably going to try to take some of the outer lying Japanese islands, at least divert attention, you know. If the Japanese send up these guys in that carrier to destroy these, then, uh, well then, it's going to be diverting troops away from this American task force, because right now the Japanese have this major task force here. You can see that's three light carriers, a fleet carrier, and a heavy battleship. And going up against this American Navy, they would probably lose, but it would be heavily contested, especially with the fact that the Americans are within kamikaze range of the Japanese home isle. So, the Americans are making use of their Battle of the Atlantic units. You can see we've got a uh, one of their Buckley-class destroyers here. Uh, pretty nice unit. I'll probably do a painted review of those. The Anzac have just completed a... Uh, Let's see, we've got a uh, transport now, plus their marine, and their fighter, so they may be able to kind of also try and contest the Japanese. Like, yes, that's a navy that can definitely take out those Japanese there, but the fact that now we've got that task force up there, we've got the Australians plus the Americans, which are right there, that's like a three-pronged attack that now... The large Japanese navy is sitting off of Calcutta, so they're kind of stuck there for the moment. And plus, the Japanese navy there is a lot of high-value units, but they're not the strongest units in the game. Or, I guess, a lot of high-powered units, but not a lot of the actual units. They only have one heavy battleship, one fleet carrier, and then a the couple of uh, the few um, light carriers. Plus the fact that... Going up against submarines, on defense they're decent because right now those planes are technically on um, combat air patrol because uh, they're carrier based and they're considered always on combat air patrol. But the problem is is that uh, on attack they can only go, those planes can only move one if they're to hit subs because they have to be on combat air patrol. So they're not going to be able to hit American subs that are in the American task force. You can see the British Navy here sitting off of Calcutta are um, basically kind of holding on to the Middle East right now. They were supplying uh, Egypt beforehand. I'm just trying to fix the glare right now. There we go, that should be better. So this fleet here has been basically sitting there and supplying Kuwait, but now that uh, the Germans were too powerful and they needed to pull back. They basically evacuated and brought them back to India. Although now, uh, like I said before, with the Fallschmieger um, detachment cutting off the Burma units, there's going to be little hope of, uh, of these guys in Burma holding back an amphibious assault from the SNLF plus the Africa Corps launching an attack into western India. Um, the British also have a small South African Navy that's been operating pretty well this whole game with, uh, you know, Axis submarines not having enough um, force to muster an assault against these few ships and that using that transport to basically bring units up. The only problem is that the Italians launched a two-pronged attack. They used up a lot of their tanks. They lost about four tanks here, but as you can see, they've almost gotten all of East Africa back and the only major force that stands in their way is the French industrial base, which really doesn't have that much stuff. These are just commanders, so they don't actually defend. And just a few British militia and a self-propelled gun. Uh, so the Americans have been trying to align Brazil, but nothing's been coming out of that. They do have a few ships on... Uh, escort duty, although there really isn't many Axis submarines anymore. So yeah, that's pretty much what's been going on. You can see that in preparations for the next turns, we've got the British with Marines and Airborne Infantry. Those Marines will be able to walk into France due to these little narrow crossings. Uh, the Airborne is hopefully to try to spread kind of 
um, confusion among the German lines where they can send in an airborne to say take some of these territories over here using their long-range aircraft and then having to divert German units to go assault those. Plus we've got um, three um, American airborne infantry and those will be able to get I think from America they can actually fly just about to France here so they'll be able to maybe pinpoint one of these French territories especially if they can take this territory here because right now the Germans are probably going to have the ability to send these heavy tanks and blitz them to Paris but if the Americans can take back Alsace Lower Lane they can uh, hold back some of the blitzing units from Germany so yeah that's pretty much what's been going on another uh, thing that the Allies were trying to do but have decided to stop was uh, align Sweden, which is basically out of the rules of the uh, Nordic expansion that I've been playing with. Uh, Sweden will align if Paris is held, and uh, then at that point, oh yeah, so if Paris is held and if Finland is allied, and they can make Finland allied basically by having a Finnish territory, rolling a die. And if it's, uh, I think, like, the number of territories they have, then Finland will surrender, basically, to the Allies. Uh, so if they do both of those, then they can basically align Sweden to the Allied side, which would definitely be a great help. You can see all those Swedish units in there. So, yeah, that's the end of 1944. Yeah. And so, yeah, we're going to be playing out this turn and then going into 45 and seeing who's going to win this conflict. Well, everybody, it's the uh, midway through 1944, and I've decided to call the game. So, uh, basically what I've got is it, pretty much now it's a foregone conclusion. You can see here that the Axis have uh, more than twice as many victory points than the Allies. Um, and I'm, I didn't even count victory cities. So... Yeah, so as you can see there, the Allies really don't have much of a chance of taking the Axis on. Still, the Germans are at, uh, even if France was liberated, they're still going to be over 100 IPCs. So, I guess we'll just go and do a quick review now. Pretty much most of this stuff is the same, because I could have played this turn out and kept going for the two more turns, but the problem is, is that... Um, Say with the Americans, they've just got, you know, they have a decent fleet right there, which probably could have been able to take out the Japanese. But when you think about the fact that uh, basically, like next turn, Japan would have been building a ton of stuff on Tokyo, um, the Americans also could have hit that Japanese fleet, but nothing really would have um, destroyed the Axis. Now, you think about even if the Americans were to go into Tokyo, take out everything in one in this turn right now, uh, and Japan were to completely surrender, they're only contributing four victory points to this amount here. So that's going to take out one, two, three, four. So still going to have more than double the amount of the allies. Um, so I guess, uh, let's see. We've got, you know, no second front able to happen. Like, the fact that Germany basically not only has taken out Russia, but there's not even any resistance out here in Siberia. So if they felt like it, they could sweep through the entirety of Russia. And I'm all out of German roundels, so that wouldn't work too well. Um, with France being taken, uh, or I guess the Germans moved back into France, took it, uh, and the Americans and French did do a pretty good job defending, but the fact that even if France or Paris was able to be taken again, you've got these German reinforcements, you've got a six or I guess five heavy tanks that would be able to hit it, so plus all these other forces, so that's kind of not too great for the Allies. The massive German Navy just got revenge on the British and took all of them out and still has enough forces to start just hitting all these little pockets of uh, allied resistance. 
the uh, Italians, with their massive navy, my plan was basically to sail them out, destroy whatever they could, but then from here go one, two, three, and then hit America. So that would have been another issue for the Allies to deal with. The Italians down here can pretty much outperform the uh, British and French, so these forces would have been able to blitz probably into South Africa and sweep up to West Africa in the future. The Germans and Japanese pretty much neutered the FEC in one turn, so they're pretty much would have they probably would have been wiped out this turn. Uh, the Anzac doing decent probably wouldn't last it too long, I think if they tried to move up to New Guinea, just because they have such a small force, Japan could have probably just sent like some aircraft down, wiped them out, and came back up. So yeah. The uh, Nationalist Chinese did pretty well. They made a comeback. You can see they've got uh, these three land zones, and the Japanese really couldn't have hit them back next turn, but that really wouldn't have made much difference in the victory point scheme of things. So yeah, I mean overall, I guess my thoughts on this 1939 setup, I think it's definitely really fun. The fact that, because I was, I was saying, I think in my last video a lot, I really liked the fact that it was a lot more, I guess, even. You know, it, it felt like a challenge for the Axis to try and use what they had to take out the certain objectives that they had. And with the Allies, it definitely felt like they had the upper hand at some points, and at other points they... Um, we're doing pretty badly, and I think like the biggest turning point would have been, or I guess big turning points that would have been like unadvisable to me, um, would have probably been to, uh, as the British, I ended up coming up and declaring war on the Vichy army, basically to take out their navy and the two German ships there, but by doing so I pretty much left myself exposed to the Italians, where even though the Italians um, lost some of their units, they still had enough to basically maintain the security of the Mediterranean, and I was too busy up here to send any units down to help reinforce Gibraltar. And especially with the fact that Britain starts with like six planes, I probably could have reinforced Gibraltar. Um, I think as Britain, my major issue that I needed to, need to fix in the future was the fact that I was pretty much kind of sporadically trying to counter German forces instead of building up and like trying to punch at them. So basically in, uh, instead of like maybe getting a bunch of Marines and then hitting Norway hard and garrison, garrisoning it, I went up to Norway a few times, liberated it, and the Germans would fly in airborns and I would pretty much just, I, I would get wiped out again and again without getting enough forces up there to really defend it. Same with Greenland. I kept trying to throw more and more units at it in small assaults where I should have built up a bunch of forces and hit it with everything I had. Um, the Germans did really well. I think, although in the beginning everything could have been ended really fast, I think in 1939 the best thing for them would be to not attack Paris first turn because I only had three units left in Paris. So if I had lost all those units and the Parisians had survived, well then, France would have had all their colonies, they would have still had Paris with a factory, and all of my tanks and mechs would have been destroyed, and I would have been in a really terrible position for other operations. Same with Norway. Norway only flew in with like two guys, so if Britain had focused more on Norway, it would have been a um, easily taken back. Uh, as Russia, I think my biggest mistake, or not really mistake, because I wanted to try the Winter War, which I thought was pretty cool with the Russians fighting the Finns, but the only problem is that uh, my big policy with Russia is, like, just don't attack Finland, because you're going to get, with the molotov Ribbentrop Pact, you'll take this territory in Karelia, but then all these Finnish units are just going to attack you when Finland aligns to Germany. And even if you were to break the pact, take all of Finland, you now have three extra territories to defend from the Germans. Um, and a lot of forces that have been lost or are stationed up here that could be defending down here. And the Russians did do a good job at having their fortification, 
line and everything. They were building heavy tanks and launching counterattacks, but again, without the the um, the extra forces that could have been supported from or supplied from up here being dispersed along this line, they had either been killed or were being held back up there. So that wasn't able to hold back the German attack. And another thing is with the loss of Transcaucasia, what I probably should have done was taken my units from Azerbaijan, moved them into Transcaucasia, and just had a huge fortified line there because the Germans kind of swept in with a few units and bombers and were able to take that out. And I think definitely the biggest things are like the Caucasus. To have a good um, defensive, I guess, redoubt strategy with Russia where if you lose, so if you got everyone just evenly dispersed and you've got your fortifications, if they break through like up here, then you've kind of got guys that are sitting around up here. So basically to have strategies of pulling out, I think. So if the Germans were to take this and then they actually captured Leningrad, which they usually do in my games, would be to then have like this territory here as your defensive line. And then even, even if you lost Moscow because Russia doesn't surrender, to then fortify this line here with Stalingrad as your main, um, main fortified area. And then with the Caucasus not falling because of the, fa the fact that if they do, Turkey on the German side really is a big pain in the neck for the Allies. Um, with the Russians also, kind of like with the British, I think a bad thing was launching sporadic assaults. Like I kept throwing guys in, I would take a territory, the Japanese would take it back. And even though they didn't really threaten Russia at all, it lost units over here that could have maybe been consolidated for a big punch had the CCP gained those territories and start building militia and further the attack. America, I think, we'll start over here. The East Coast did a really good job at, you know, shucking units in, deploying them to Normandy, and I think also just using combined arms warfare. The fact that I would have the British move in, hit Normandy, even if they would have, like, a couple units left, then have the French reinforce it with their militia and whatever they could fly in, and then finally have the because the Italians, even though they go, they don't have a lot to reinforce anything. Then have the Americans come in and hit Normandy also. So you've got a bunch, a big multinational force, and you can see that's what's been in Normandy. And they've been able to hold out for like the last three turns and sporadically keep hitting Paris. So I definitely think that's a good strategy to hold on to, is to communicate with the players, even though it was just me, but uh, using all the nations. Kind of, a lot of people... Um, that I've played with are kind of like, you know, it, it's dumb that the nations go at different turns, like they should all be able to go at once. But I feel like if you use the rules to your advantage, the fact that towards the end of the turn, you've got Britain, all of the Commonwealth nations with Britain, then France, then Italy, which is a little smaller of a power, and then America. So you've got this trifecta of the three, uh, three big powers, or France is a little less so, but you can basically do like triple attacks and reinforcing territories with all those nations. Um, the British in Africa were doing decent because even though they lost Egypt, they were sending a lot of units up. But I think that a better strategy probably would have been to have the FEC build more units. So like maybe build a factory first, then build more units to then ship over to Kuwait and then to just hit the Germans hard. Uh, and even reinforce Iran, because um, I had, as you remember from a few turns ago, I think a few years ago actually, we had uh, guys in Transjordan and down there in Sudan, but after the Africa Corps hit Transjordan, there was only one front for the Italians to deal with, which really kind of ended the um, any hopes of the British retaking North Africa. Um, and then even a small assault here, if the French had been lend-leased a few more items, and maybe the British had came to come down with like two transports to just hit North Africa, um, even though the Germans probably would have been able to hold in some territories, I feel like it would have taken the strain uh, of the, the Middle Eastern Front back towards North Africa. Uh, 
because right now the Germans were just able to keep piling guys in, and especially once they connected uh, these two fronts here, the Eastern Front and the North African Front. Plus, with the addition of Turkey, it was kind of all over. And, you know, you've got stuff like this where they could even spare units to go and take Egypt, or, I mean, India. So, yeah. The Japanese, I think, did really poorly in this game. So, I think, again, it's really realistic in the sense of when you start in 1939, the Japanese really don't have the men and material to easily take out all of China. And you can see they basically got there, but then the turn before the Burma Road was first closed, um, the Americans sent 20 IPCs, which the Chinese built a bunch of infantry here, and then were able to start taking back territory. And you can see if this kept going on, these forces up here could hit that, but they can't blitz to there. So these forces could keep marching around China. Um, another thing with the Japanese was that I didn't really prioritize a good planned invasion of Southeast Asia. So it wasn't until 1942, or uh, I think the end of 1942, that the Japanese were able to take Southeast Asia. So um, with a little bit more forces, like if the British were doing a little better in the Mediterranean, they probably could have sent some naval forces down and with the Anzacs maybe hit the Japanese fleet and really uh, damaged it, uh, which would have really hurt their ability to take any of these islands. So, yeah. And I think also with the with the um, the forces is that Japan, most of the time, will leave a few of the islands in the, um, the Dutch, the a few of the Dutch islands. So when they first invaded, they left uh, this one and these two. So, and also Sarawak. So I think if the Anzacs and the FEC have a few planes, like maybe a couple fighters and a couple of infantry, to then quickly you know, have a, a force that can basically send units there. So, like, if the FEC, I mean, if uh, the Anzacs had a few, two infantry and a fighter, and then the Japanese attacked the Dutch East Indies, they could basically just go one, or uh, one, two, three, and then just start trying to land forces and contest them. And though they may not have a big navy, the fact that if they send some forces up, if the FEC can get some forces in, the Japanese are going to have to fight around to, and at least that'll contain them there. They won't be able to just start moving on to India. But yeah, so I think that's just about everything there is to talk about. Italy did really well, um, and I think a big thing about Italy is that though Germany needs the money at some points, it's definitely pretty good to send Italy money. I've seen, like, with Germany... Once you get up to, like, 60 IPCs to start sending them, like, at least 20, uh, because they can really just start really hitting the British hard. And you can see that they were able to outbuild the British in Africa. They helped the Germans out in the Middle East. And they built, like, a massive navy that even the Americans couldn't really go back into touch. So, yeah. But I guess that's just about it for my 1939 game. And so... Hope to see you next time, and I think the next game I'll be playing is my global 1914 game, and if uh, you guys have seen the videos I put out on that, where it was uh, basically being made on the computer, I definitely advise you to check them out if you haven't seen it, but in that box right there is that map, and so sadly I'll be ha having to go off to college um, after Christmas, but I'll be back in the summer. And again, I'll keep up the videos. Like, for the past couple months, I've been pumping out videos uh, from college. So, once I go back, expect more videos, but not a lot of gameplay. And, uh, and yeah, so, summertime, get ready for that 1914 game. Because though Historical Board Gaming is putting out their game, I really like mine, and I'm happy to show you guys it. And maybe, and it's a free download, so... Uh, you, you guys will be able to download that and play it yourselves with your 1914 collections. So yeah, I hope to see you guys again, and I hope you really like this video. Uh, remember to subscribe and hit the like button if you like seeing these gameplay videos and you want to see more of them. And uh, yeah, so hope to see you guys again. Cobra, out.